Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. Today we have a very special guest, Ian Easton of the Project 2049 Institute, who has a, a fairly recent book called The Chinese Invasion Threat, Taiwan's Defense and American Strategy in Asia. It's a great book. I recommend it. Ian, say hello. Hello. Great. Give us a, tell us about yourself. So Chris, thanks for having me. I am a research fellow at the Project 2049 Institute and an author of this book, mm -hmm. which, uh, as I'm sure you're all well aware, is really a love story, oh. nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And it's a story of Xi Jinping mm -hmm. and the Chinese Communist Party who are totally in love with Taiwan, I also see. known as the Republic of China. Also and known as Taiwan Province, China. Also known as, that's what they call it sometimes. Or a splitist entity. Those are just it's affectionate names. Mm -hmm. just, it's like somebody calling you pumpkin or yeah. is sweetheart. Is it an unrequited love? Thus far. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing about this situation is that Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party have invested a lot of time, a lot of talent, and a lot of treasure in preparing to make sure that Taiwan does not go in another direction. Mm -hmm. and doesn't stays, maybe hook up with the United States. Which is something that makes Xi Jinping, I think, feel very insecure. And mm -hmm. so he's engaged in this massive military buildup against Taiwan, and he is preparing, it appears, to subjugate Taiwan at Bayonet Point. And so far it's not working for him, but he's preparing for it. And... Obviously, there's some mischief involved, and there's some high drama. And so I thought I would write a book about this, about how the Chinese see it, or at least the PLA mostly, how the Taiwanese see it, and what it all means for America. Classic love story. Love triangle, almost. Tale as old as time. Yes, indeed. The Chinese Communist Party has been talking about invading Taiwan and taking it over really since Mao's time. So this is, how can you say this is something that's like new to Xi Jinping? Well, that's a good point. So in July of 1950, mm -hmm. the PLA first got the order from Mao Zedong. It was the star commander of the Third Field Army at the time that the Chinese Civil War was going very well for the Chinese Communist Party at the time. And they decided to add Taiwan to their list of objectives, of provinces or territories that they wanted to capture. This is when the Communist Party was basically sweeping from north to south. Exactly. Taking over mainland China. Exactly. And it was that summer of 19, uh, excuse me, 1949, I misspoke. The summer of 1949, uh, July, where the Third Field Army was marching from Shanghai all the way down the coast to Fujian province. This really is a love story. Ah, oh, the summer of 1949, wandering down the beaches. It's when with it all the started. PLA, and it was at that moment that the PLA first started preparing. They first started to draw up a blueprint for massive amphibious uh, invasion operations against Taiwan, and the planning went on for about 12 months. And it wasn't really until late June of 1950 when the outbreak of Korean War. And, of course, the United States intervened. President Truman ordered the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Strait. And after that, well, the rest is history. So what ended up happening is a stalemate, a stalemate in the Taiwan Strait and ultimately a stalemate on the Korean Peninsula. Both of these stalemates exist until this day, almost 70 years later. And they continue to shape the contours of our defense and national security policy in Asia. These are the two most dangerous flashpoints probably on the planet. It's interesting that they've gone 70 years without any kind of resolution. It's kind of what happens, you know, when you don't communicate in a relationship, kind of th things build up. Absolutely. Are you speaking from experience, Matt? No, I'm just saying in general. I can't tell you how many girlfriends I've had to point missiles at over the years. I have many restraining orders. Uh, come on, guys. <laughs> there we go. I, I, I just yes. I wasn't sure if you were making a joke, so I, I didn't want to laugh at, at something that could be a very serious legal problem for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, the Taiwan Relations Act 
and Reagan's six assurances to Taiwan are basically a giant American and international community style restraining order on the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> so let's t- tell us more, because I f- wonder how long we can keep this metaphor going. It's really holding up yeah. pretty well. How are they a restraining order? So the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979 says two very important things. The first important thing it says is that the United States will provide the arms and services to Taiwan that it needs to maintain its self-defense capabilities against a possible PLA attack. The second and perhaps even more important thing that it says is that the United States will maintain the capacity to resist any Chinese attempt, whether it's coercive or full-on military operations against Taiwan that would threaten Taiwan's society or its government. What does coercive mean? Intimidation. Mm-hmm. It's just it's about intimidation. And this is a gray area, obviously. How do you define the bully and the victim and all the dynamics that are at play? And how do you support the victim of a bully? Because ultimately, that's the other part of this story. Well, you give the victim a machine gun and then the bully is screwed. Or at a minimum, F-16s and Patriot Three missile batteries. Sometimes I, I wish I had you on my playground when I was in uh, elementary school. Things would have been very different. I can tell there's no question (laughs) but in this case one of the problems is we have also we as the united states have also allowed ourselves to be intimidated by the people's republic of china and so especially over the past 10 years we have actually started to downplay our support for taiwan and we've cut back on things like regular high quality arm sales to taiwan that we've convinced ourselves even that Taiwan doesn't actually need a modern air force or a modern navy. They don't need things like new fighter planes or ballistic missile defense sort of or the tanks. Porcupine defense. Exactly, and so that was a very good article. That was uh, certainly a very well-meaning article that was written uh, by a scholar at the Naval War College in 2008, and it became twisted for political reasons. And so he was trying to come up with a very elegant solution to a very very difficult strategic. Uh, and defense problem, and he did. But unfortunately, for political reasons, his argument got used as a justification for the United States basically ending any kind of high-quality arms sale to Taiwan, any any of the arms sales that might result in snarls of disapproval from well, Beijing. So then what was, the, what was he trying to say with the porcupine defense, and what did it become? Well, you would have to ask him for sure okay. about that. I, I'm certainly not qualified to answer that uh, directly, but I can tell you what has happened mm-hmm. in Washington. What has happened is that many analysts and many government officials have convinced themselves that it's not in our national interest to actually follow the letter and the spirit of the Taiwan Relations Act and Reagan Six Assurances. And more recently, some people are complaining about the Taiwan Travel Act. And they're actually complaining about Congress. They're saying, yes, every single member of Congress, both the House and the Senate, voted for this, and the president signed it. But that is a really bad idea. Why? Because it might upset the Chinese. And we really do care about hurting the feelings of the Chinese people. But I was going to ask, you said this has been happening over the past 10 years. How has the Trump administration been different different or similar to the Obama administration dealing with Taiwan? Well, in many ways, I think there have been more similarities Mm -hmm. than differences in terms of practice. Mm -hmm. The rhetoric. Trump's not going to want to hear that. The rhetoric has been very different. No one's going to want to hear Trump and Obama are the same. No, that would be boring. And so, what I can tell you is the rhetoric is very different. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, things like the Taiwan Travel Act, things like the arms sale notification uh, that was notified to Congress last June. And there's something about like making a de facto embassy in Taiwan, right? Well, we've always had a de facto embassy. We have an mm-hmm. embassy that is an embassy in every way, shape, and form except name. Mm-hmm. Just AIT. like Taiwan is in every way, shape, and form a nation, except it's just a region. Exactly. And so this is just an example of that. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, one of the things that, that struck me about Trump is after he got elected about a month later, he took a congratulatory phone call from Tsai Ing-wen, the president of Taiwan. So I had thought that this might be a signal that Trump's uh, 
attitude towards dealing with Taiwan was going to be different than Obama or Bush. And what do you think about that? I think you're right. I think there are a lot of people who are very, very smart on these issues, who are advising our president, and they have encouraged him over the past 500 days or so that he's been in office. They've encouraged him to start, to, at a minimum, rethink our Taiwan policy because we've never really defined what exactly it is. There's not been a Taiwan policy review since 1992, 1993, and it was rolled out in 1994. Mm-hmm. We and haven't done it since then, and the facts on the ground have changed incredibly since then. I mean, Taiwan's become a flourishing democracy, and China, well, China's gone in a very unpleasant and unfortunate direction since then, and it's also become very, very powerful. And so I think it makes a lot of sense for the Trump administration to start to rethink some of the assumptions that we have had for a very long time. And you bring up a good point that um, it is strange how now you are seeing reports of like, oh, no, we can't anger the Chinese Communist Party as if that is that is the worst thing you could do versus defending Taiwan from an obviously hostile country. Well, Chris, I'll tell you, one of my objectives in writing this book mm-hmm. was to try to anger up the blood in Zhongnanhai. Mm-hmm. I mean, besides all the you know the big dollars well, this will bring in. Yeah, I mean, obviously there, there's the self-interest, right? Mm-hmm. I have a very good incentive to write a book like this, uh, in particular because I live close to the Pentagon, mm-hmm. and my office where we are now is very close to the Pentagon. And so if World War III was to ever break out over we Taiwan— We want to go back to New York first. You would definitely maybe, maybe probably want to get maybe, out of yeah, New York, like too. Ohio. Um, but you wouldn't want to be here. That's— that's for certain. And so it's probably more likely that we will stumble our way into great power conflict if we are kept in the dark. And if we're stupid, then we're probably more likely to do stupid things. And one of the areas where we as a country, we as a community of analysts that look at China have been afraid to do research is on this particular issue. And so every year the the Pentagon in their annual report on Chinese military power uh, to the U.S. Congress, they say the number one priority of the PLA is Taiwan, is actually annexing, is preparing for this type of contingency. But nobody wants to do any research on it because it's so scary and because they are afraid of potentially angering up the blood in Beijing. Wait, wait, when you say, so the number one, like overall, the People's Liberation Army, with all that it has to do in terms of, you know, being the Communist Party's military, their number one priority is Taiwan? Without question. External. Obviously, they have an internal role to play as well. Censoring Winnie the Pooh memes. I mean, that's critical. But luckily, at home, they have a lot of help from the People's Armed Police and Ministry of Public Security. and uh, So if Ministry people start gathering in a square again, they can send the Public Security Bureau in. They don't need the People's Liberation Army this time. Well, they could be backstopped by the PLA. I mean, that'd be one of the PLA's jobs as well. But if you look at the the main force assets of the PLA, their principal war planning scenario is actually the invasion and occupation of Taiwan. So we're talking about they're spending tens of billions of dollars a year at least. More than that. uh, Literally hundreds of billions of dollars. A year. A year. Just focused on Taiwan. Yes. Probably, if you look at the overall budget of the PLA, and nobody knows exactly how much they spend, and nobody knows what things cost them, so even if you knew their aggregate defense budget, you still wouldn't know what it costs them to train, man, and equip, say, a paratrooper battalion, or a destroyer flotilla, or a missile brigade, or a brigade of tanks. Uh, or a squadron of fighter planes. No, nobody knows what that costs them. But what you can say is, when you look at PLA writings, you can make an estimate that probably 60 to 70% of everything that they do, everything that they work on, that they spend, that they recruit, train, man, and equip for, is directed at Taiwan. They also have to worry about border security, especially with India and with the North Korea border. They have to worry about a few other smaller from their perspective, much easier contingencies. And of course, they have to worry about fighting a great power war with the United States. But that's mostly about Taiwan. Interesting. So all the 
military technology that they're hacking and stealing from U.S. defense contractors. They're actually thinking, okay, how can we use this against Taiwan? Against Taiwan and also against the United States. Okay. So what would a boots-on-the-ground war between China and Taiwan look like? Nobody knows for sure. Certainly, the Taiwanese military has thought a lot about that. And so when I was doing research for the book, I went in and I interviewed a lot of people in Taiwan, both in the military and security services. And then also I read a lot of their professional journals. So the the Taiwanese military, because Taiwan's a democracy, so they're very transparent, actually. Anybody can go online and you can download the latest edition of their professional journal. Well, I I don't get it. I thought Chinese people aren't ready for democracy. Well, apparently... Some of them are. Shh, you can't say that. Yeah, and that may be one of the reasons why the book has been banned, apparently, in, in China and, and Hong Kong. But, um, but, yeah, you can actually learn a tremendous amount, and they, they look at this issue. And if you dig into PLA writings, they also look at it. And they think about what it would look like. Mm-hmm. And in a word, what would it look like? It would, it would be catastrophic. It'd be awful it'd be the stuff of nightmares this when you look at this particular scenario you're talking about incredibly high intensity military operations the likes of which nobody is engaged in for decades and it's all in urban areas Mm. you go to taiwan and you look at the battle space these are heavily populated areas now well i know in in china and i think inner mongolia they've got a a military training ground that has been designed to look like the presidential palace in Taipei. Yeah, there's a full-scale replica of the presidential office and also a Taichung International Airport, which is also, it's a dual-use facility. It's also CCK Air Base. Mm-hmm. It's one of Taiwan's most important air bases. So they have a full-scale model of it. And what they do, and they have models of all parts of Taiwan, all over China. But this is the most spectacular version. And what they did for the air base is they built this scale model, and then they practiced uh, cutting the runways with their ballistic missiles. They actually launched ballistic missiles into it. They actually bombed it from the air. What they did with the presidential office, apparently, when they first built it, the first thing they did is they fired a cruise missile to send a signal. They fired a cruise missile through the window of the mock-up they had of the president's office, where, where pre- at that time it was President Ma Ying-jeou, now President Tsai Ing-wen, where she goes to work every day and to see if they could hit the desk. Now, I don't know if they succeeded or not, but they destroyed part of the building, then they rebuilt it. And more recently, at a moment when the U.S. and Taiwan had a very high-level defense talk, talk, it was a rather low-key affair at the Pentagon, they broadcast on state television in China images of Chinese commandos fighting room to room and through the hallways of this mock-up they have of the presidential office. Just in April, when the U.S. and Taiwan were engaged in some defense and, and military talks, the Chinese broadcast images of a Taiwanese village, mock Taiwanese village they had created outside of Nanjing, and then they showed these images of PLA troops uh, engaged in live fire exercises, blowing up what looked like a civilian residential building or a commercial building. And to make sure nobody mistook that for any other possible place, they had giant billboards where they put on uh, Zhonghua Telecoms, which is Taiwan's national telecommunications carrier. Wow. So they're very serious about preparing for this, and they use stuff like this, killing the Taiwanese in effigy, basically, uh, to send these types of political signals. Are they trying to intimidate Taiwanese people, too, do you think? Absolutely. No question about it. Unfortunately for them, they've not been very successful. But perhaps fortunately for them, they have been successful at intimidating a lot of other people around the world and using them kind of as a proxy to isolate the Taiwanese. And so Taiwan is becoming more and more isolated internationally. It's losing its international space, which was already very limited. And it is destabilizing the security situation. Do you think that's why we had the situation where, you know, like a lot of media are are 
concerned about angering China in supporting Taiwan because they're for their, they've been focused on this kind of uh, military propaganda of like what 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 World War Three might look like. I think that there's a false assumption that some people make that by sticking up for our national security interests, by sticking up for our fundamental national principles and values and our ideals, that we are somehow being warmongers, that we're somehow doing the wrong thing. And I think it's backward logic. I think a better way to look at it is that it's the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping in particular because his behavior is very different than that of Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao was not a great guy and he was not a great leader. He did a lot of unpleasant things, but nothing compared to Xi Jinping, especially as far as Taiwan is concerned. And I think it behooves us to look in a very sober way at what the Chinese are doing what Xi Jinping is doing, and to say for ourselves and to judge for ourselves, is this right? Are we going to accept this? Are we going to resist? Are we going to push back? Are we going to stand up for democracy? Or is it okay for future generations of Taiwanese and Japanese and Americans to grow up living in a less and less free society? Because ultimately that's what will happen, right? If, if we don't stand up, for what we believe is right, the Chinese Communist Party will continue to advance its interests and they will create a new world order. What is the thinking on this from the Pentagon? Well, you would have to ask them. And I'm sure there's very good and healthy debate that is going on on these issues. But I couldn't say for sure. I don't think that there's any consensus that has been reached. I think we as a country and our government are still trying to wrap their heads around the fact that our China policy has failed us. We've not achieved our national objectives. All the things that we assume to be true, because of course we assume that if we treated the Chinese Communist Party, if we treated the PRC like a friend, it would become a friend. And of course, it's become right. very adversarial. And so now we have to rethink our approach. And I think there is a consensus here in Washington, D.C. that our, our approach has failed us and we need to come up with a new one. But we haven't been able to do that yet. I don't think there's a consensus. I think it's we're still in that period where everybody realizes the ship is sinking and then there's a debate on do we get in the lifeboats or can we plug all the leaks? Why should the United States consider Taiwan important? Is that something your average citizen really should care about? Absolutely. Because, again, this is one of the most dangerous flashpoints on the planet. This is something that, if we were to get wrong, could lead to World War III. And there's not very many issues in international politics you can say that about. Taiwan is also on the front lines of the free world's strategic competition with authoritarian powers like China. Now there's a China-Russia axis, but of course China's so much stronger than Russia. So Taiwan really is on the front lines. And if we were for any reason to lose Taiwan, that would represent a catastrophe, the likes of which we've not seen in probably, probably since Pearl Harbor. It, it would make 9-11 just pale in comparison for how strategically shocking that would be for the United States and for all of our allies and, and for the order that we've created in the Pacific. You lose Taiwan, it becomes extremely difficult to defend Japan. And the U.S.-Japan alliance would almost certainly suffer a, a tremendous loss, a tremendous loss of confidence. The same is true for South Korea. It's very difficult for us to meet our security commitments to South Korea if we lose Taiwan, if the Chinese can actually occupy Taiwan. The same is true for the Philippines. Eventually, it would become true for U.S. territory, Guam, and Hawaii would be under threat. Oh, and this is because of Taiwan's strategic location specifically. Exactly. And so there are two pieces to this that are both very important to bear in mind. One is the geostrategic, and that's sort of a cold, heartless look at why this matters to me in well, terms of my national security, 
right? Mm-hmm. So Chris, this would be you. Yeah. And I'm guessing you guys have more of a heart. I'm just guessing. Shelly I don't does. know. Shelly, I'm guessing. Yes, I'm the token heart of the mm-hmm. team. Yeah. So me too. I'm kind of a soft touch. And when I look at it, understanding, of course, immense geostrategic value just because of the location, which is vital. But there's also that other piece. It's about, ultimately, it's about our values. It's about our principles. It's about what we believe in. Taiwan is is an American-style democracy. And if we're not willing to stand up for that, what are we willing to stand up for? I think you've managed to move my heart. Well, so one thing I wonder, is this just all bluster from the Chinese military? Because the People's Liber- the People's Liberation Army exists mainly as a political or ideological organization. Most of their training, or a big part of their training, revolves around just reading the works of Marx and Mao. Are they even capable of this kind of offensive that would be very difficult? Well, you know, when you spend 30 to 40 percent of your week reading Mao Zedong thought and Deng Xiaoping theory and Jiang Zemin's three represents, you could imagine how angry that <laughs> must make you and how bored you would be. It could be the case that the PLA brilliant. is only too ready to commit mass violence against any possible adversary that the mm-hmm. CCP Politburo points them at. But I think you're right. I think ultimately... Their goal in the near term is to weaken hearts and minds, and of course, backbones uh, in Taiwan and across the world. That's their near term goal. That's achievable for them. Mm-hmm. And there's something they're very good at. Mm-hmm. Fighting an actual war, it's a big question mark. Nobody knows how good they would actually be, how tough they actually are. Yeah. Well, I mean, they haven't been in a real uh, armed conflict since uh, the war with Vietnam. And, the and even that was. I mean, that, that's tiny. Mm-hmm. That would be like a, a single drop of water in the Potomac River compared to how complicated and how bloody a massive amphibious assault of Taiwan would be. So it's the threat of war that is their most powerful tool, not an actual war. I think that is the most powerful tool of any military, if properly applied. Mm-hmm. I don't think democracies generally employ their military force that way. I certainly don't see good examples of it uh, on the U.S. side or with any of our allies. We could, but we don't generally engage in that type of activity. Sooner or later, there's going to be a U.S.-Canada war. It's going to happen. But we're not going to let them know in advance. True. We're not going to be— We do need that precious, precious maple syrup. Yeah, nobody's going to be building a replica of uh, Ottawa and sending— a cruise missile through it, I guess. I mean, our pancakes are not going to sweeten themselves yeah. after all. No. And I really just want Trudeau's socks. Absolutely. But so you said the a war with Taiwan for China would be very uh, strategically difficult. What, what makes it so complicated? Well, there's a lot of things that are complicated about it. Geography. Geography favors the defender in this case. The weather. Again, it favors Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan has a very large military for a country of its size. It actually spends a lot on defense on a per capita basis. They have a well-trained military. This is a military that has been interfacing with the United States military since 1950, 1951. And so they, over time, they become very professional. It's a very modern fighting force. And also, of course, uh, equipped with a lot of American-made equipment, a lot of cutting-edge capabilities. Taiwanese intelligence is also very good. They have had some stunning successes in the past at penetrating uh, the Chinese Communist Party and the PLA in particular and stealing some of their crown jewels, if you will. And so they, they do have some very real advantages. They would also have local numerical advantage. So when the Chinese started to land troops on the beaches, or when they started to land paratroopers uh, at the port facilities or or airfields, for example, the Taiwanese are going to outnumber them massively, at least in the first few days of war. And this is always the case in any amphibious operation because the Taiwanese are going to have very short lines of logistics. 
they're already on the ground. They've already mobilized because, of course, they can see the invasion coming. And that's what makes invasion very interesting from a military planning perspective is unlike a bolt out of the blue missile raid, which is very, very difficult to predict or to see coming in advance to sound the alarm, or a blockade, which can come on very suddenly. When you're talking about an invasion, China would have to mobilize. They would have to mobilize in mass. They would have to stockpile in mass. They would have to do a lot of very unusual things that they would never ever do in peacetime that would sound alarms in Taipei. It would also sound alarms here in Washington, D.C. And so you could start to see it coming and you can start to prepare in advance for it. And that's one of the interesting things about this particular scenario. So the U.S. could send a bunch of aircraft carriers in the Taiwan Strait? No question. And submarines. And SEAL Team 6. So so this doesn't sound like it's a very likely scenario. I hope that it, the likelihood is less than 1%. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Mm-hmm. I've done a lot of research on it, and I've thought about it a lot, and I've written quite a bit on it, and I'm still not sure. I don't know how likely it is. It seems to me that any rational leader of any country, even the PRC, is going to loathe even considering actually doing anything like this. And so as long as the leadership in Beijing keeps their cool, it's close to a 0% chance. But if for some reason they were to stop thinking rationally, which often happens, especially in authoritarian countries, and especially when you're talking about a dictatorship where you have one guy who's surrounded by sycophantic advisors who are afraid of him and don't want to bring him bad information or don't really want to tell him the truth all the time because of what his reaction might be, and especially when you have somebody with a proven track record of purging some of his top generals, he may not get best quality information. And so we could be looking at a future where it's more than a 1% chance. Mm -hmm. But in the end, we we don't know. I think it's very unlikely. And I think that there are things that we can and should be doing as Americans to make it even less likely. Um, Well, you brought up a good point, which goes back to the idea that the... um People's Liberation Army is still more more an ideological organization. Like the purging of generals that Xi Jinping did, he purged a lot of the top generals that his main political rival, former Chinese leader Jiang Zemin, promoted in the army, so he would have control over the army. So this is where you see the army as more of a institution that different political factions in the Communist Party just mainly struggle over. But you mentioned what, what the United States could do. What could the United States do? Well, I think the first thing that we need to do is to shine a light on this problem. Mm -hmm. This is the type of thing that can become very pernicious if we avoid it, if we stick our collective head in the sand and just hope it goes away. It's going to get worse over time. What is the kind of thing that you're talking about? A threat like this. Okay. The threat of a war with China. Mm Mm-hmm. Because the Chinese are thinking about it. They're preparing for it, and they're threatening us with it, and they're threatening our friends and allies with it. And so if we stay silent, if we are paralyzed by fear, if we choose not to stand up for what we believe is right because of you know, these threats that we face, then we're going to get to a very dark place. And that could actually make conflict a whole lot more likely. But if we begin to prepare ourselves... For this potential conflict, if we support our friends and allies, if we build up our own military force, and if we educate our own citizens of the challenges that we face, then we're going to get to a much safer place. Because I think what we're probably looking at in the coming years and perhaps decades is a long-term strategic competition with China. And one of the most difficult issues for us is going to be how do we keep Taiwan from becoming a giant battlefield? How do we convince the Chinese? How do we deter them? And how do we prepare 
in the event that deterrence fails? How do we make sure that Taiwan is never actually invaded? Well, here's a question. One of the things that the Chinese Communist Party has said is that if Taiwan were to officially declare its independence, then they would, you know, the Communist Party would immediately send in the PLA and, and take them over. Is that true? Well, nobody knows, and they don't know. The anti-separatism law is sometimes mistranslated as the anti-secession law. In Chinese, it's not secession. Secession is what happened in the United States during the Civil War, which is why they like to use that term. It's the anti-separation law. And in that, it's very vague. If you actually read what is in there, it's short and it's very vague. There's a, lo there's a lot of area, there's a lot of wiggle room for the Chinese Communist Party. Because what does it actually mean for Taiwan or the Republic of China? What does it mean for them to declare independence? They are already an independent country, and they have been since Chiang Kai-shek moved the, the seat of the ROC government there in December 1949. From then until now, they've, they've been an independent country. We recognized them. We had an embassy in Taipei from 1949 until 1979, and then we switched diplomatic relations, but they didn't go away. In fact, they just became more legitimate because they became a democracy that enjoys, well, popular sovereignty. Right, but for 40 years we've been playing this word game where the Taiwanese embassy in the U.S. is not an embassy, it's the Taiwan Economic and Cultural Affairs Office, Yeah. right, and all these things. So we've been continuing to play the the word game that the Communist Party doesn't really want, but they, they prefer it, right, to, uh, to total independence. Uh, so what would happen if, what would happen if, if President Trump tweeted tomorrow, Taiwan is a country, and we're going to stand by this country. We are, do, we are all doing the hand. The hand, yeah. <laughs> Taiwan is a country. It is a tremendous country, the best, and we're going to stand by our allies, exclamation point. <laughs> just, also, just so everyone who's listening knows, no, Donald Trump did not come into the, the room. That was Matt doing an impersonation. Yes, Matt's expert impersonation. You forgot to add, uh, add that like there are beautiful Trump hotels in Taiwan. Or there that, will be. <laughs> that is there true. Be. They, have, they have the best beaches. Imagine Trump hotels and condos along the beach. Beautiful view of China. <laughs> that would be Let fantastic. Me, again, Trump did not walk into the office. This is, that was Matt. That was all Matt. No, so, I think we don't know what they would do. They don't know what they would do for sure. We don't know how we define our own policy. Because ultimately, one of the problems that we tend to have, and I say this, the think tank community, I think American media, major corporations, universities, is the first thing that people ask themselves when Taiwan-related questions come up is, oh my God, what will the Chinese think? That's the first thing people ask themselves. Right, and all these companies have been changing you know, references to Taiwan on their website to be the politically correct That's version. That's exactly right, and it's ridiculous. These corporations are willing to distort the truth, distort objective reality, the facts on the ground, deny them in order to appease a hostile adversary that we're engaged in a strategic competition with. I would call it Orwellian fear. nonsense. Yeah, are, Orwellian nonsense. I think that captures it well. But there are so many people who could take planes in China. That's right. And so there's a profit motive there for some, right? I think for those who don't know what we're talking about, we should give just a bit of background on that. Fine, I'll give a bit of background on I that. I mean, I could do it. I didn't know what the look was. <laughs> so basically starting this year, the Chinese Communist Party has been putting a lot of pressure on Western companies, uh, particularly airlines, or any company that uh, makes the mistake of referencing Taiwan as uh, a country. Or, or a region. Or a region. Now it's even a region. And like writing letters to them, you know, demanding, threatening their business interests in China if they don't. We mm -hmm. will, yeah, we will take off your website in China. Mm -hmm. And they, so they're forcing Western companies to call Taiwan by the names that the Communist Party wants them to call. Which is either Taiwan province, comma, China, or Taiwan region, comma, China, or to simply list Taiwanese cities under the country of China. And this is something the Trump administration had called Orwellian nonsense. That didn't stop any Western companies from 
Maybe United Airlines. Fingers crossed. Really? So far. Oh. Absolutely. Here's, a, here's my question about that. Is that a serious thing? Because we make fun of it on our show, like China Uncensored. Like, we make fun of the fact that the Chi- Chinese Communist Party, like, asked these companies to do this about Taiwan and that these companies would fold. But is there a serious strategic reason that they're doing that? Oh, absolutely. They're not just getting companies to fold. They're getting everybody to fold, even our own State Department, even our own national policy, that our diplomats stumble over themselves trying to contort words and contort reality to avoid this problem. And this gets back to the central point, is fear. Everyone is afraid of provoking, quote unquote, the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping. And so the first question they ask when Taiwan comes up is, what will Beijing think? What will Beijing do? The question that they don't ever ask is, does this decision actually make any sense for me? Does this make sense for America? Does it make sense for our foreign policy to distort reality? Is that going to help our diplomacy around the world? Is that going to help us achieve our strategic objectives around the world? And corporations could ask the same thing. If I fold on this issue, does that signal strength? Or does it make the Chinese lose any and all respect for me? And then they're just going to ask for more and more and more and more. And then they'll, they'll get it, right? And so people don't approach this question from where they should, in my opinion anyways, and that is, does this decision make sense on its merits? Does it make sense for me? Does it make sense for America? They ask instead, what will China think? What does China want? And that, well, that's a big problem. For independent airline companies, for instance, who realize that China is going to become the largest market for them in a couple of years, for them, it's a question of what about our business interests? And for them, very clearly, uh, appeasing the Chinese Communist Party is in their business interests. Right, but it's partly like, okay, let's say— I would dispute that, by the way, and I'll I, tell you why if, if you want to have— Well, I would say, like, if, if the airline companies that are American-based get together and say, we're going to stand up on this issue by continuing to list Taiwan as a separate country or region— uh, and they just do that. Probably the repercussions on them as a whole would be very low, probably nothing except some angry letters uh, because what could happen is then, well, what is what is the Chinese Communist Party going to do? Say, oh, well, you're banned now from, from having destinations in China, but the U.S. could ban and its allies could ban Chinese airlines from having destinations in their countries, and that would be a total trade war of airlines, and that's unlikely to happen. So there is something to be said for kind of collectively standing up. Well, Ian, I'm, I'm curious what you were going to say. Well, I think that's a great point is reciprocity is important and proportionality is important as well. What's also important for, I think, many companies to think about and to look at is, yes, there may be short-term, short-term gains to be had from capitulating under pressure, but over the longer term, what happens when you do that is the Chinese Communist Party will just keep asking for more and more and more. And ultimately, what will happen is AVIC will build the planes that today Boeing is building and an Airbus is building because they're already pilfering all their technology and their talent, and then they'll drive them out of the market. And so if companies were more strategic, and if our own government was more strategic, in my view, we would all have more of a backbone. And just as an example of the dog that sometimes doesn't bark or bite, when I published this book, people came out of the woodwork telling me or asking me, are you all right? Is is everything okay? Have you been attacked? And I'll tell you, my feelings were hurt a little bit by the fact that I did not get a single angry phone call from the PRC embassy. I was really looking forward to being demarched to be honest with you, that there were no cyber attacks on my computer, knock on wood, not yet. Nobody came in and trashed the office or stole my stuff. I wasn't accosted on the streets here or in Tokyo or in Taipei or wherever I went promoting the book, that nothing bad happened to me. And so I can't 
say that nothing bad will happen to anybody who does anything on topics like this. That, of course, is not always true. But what I would say is, at least in my own very limited experience, it's okay to act in your own interest as an American. That you don't have to self-censor. You don't have to constantly worry about what does Beijing think. You should be worrying about what is in your own best interest, what is in your organization's own best interest. Well, Ian, if it makes you feel better, I can say that you're racist against Chinese people. That, that helps. How's that? Well, I mean, that's the usual criticism they levy against people who criticize the Chinese Communist Party. And if you're feeling like you didn't get the proper attention for your book, you're racist against Chinese people. That hurts my feelings, too. Oh, I can't win with this guy. Chris, how many times have you been threatened by the Communist Party? Uh, lots and lots. <laughs> yep, I'm, I have to deal with a lot of danger as Chris Chappell, host of China Uncensored and China Unscripted. But, uh, you know, it's not about me. It's about, you know, it's about listening to, to Ian today. So I, I don't want to delve into, into You don't want to tell story. the stories? Okay. I'm Another looking day. forward to hearing those stories yeah. a little <laughs> later on. <laughs> Uh, to quickly uh, get off of this topic, uh, what it reminds me of is actually very similar to the situation in the South China Sea, where uh, the Chinese Communist Party started dredging up sand on submerged shoals to create islands and say that was their territory. And everyone was kind of like, eh, you shouldn't do that. But no real pressure was doled out. And then they started building things on these fake islands and again it was like you shouldn't do that but again no pressure and now the situation is much more complicated because they've actually militarized these fake islands even though surprise surprise they said they wouldn't and they did anyways uh it seems like it's a similar situation where at this earlier point in time we can actually apply pressure but if we don't do it now the more time that goes by things will be harder to solve no question about it i encourage everyone to read the children's book if you give a mouse a cookie because we know it's just going to then ask for a glass of milk it escalates out of control out of control that's why a moose will do the same thing and the pig where builds the tree house yeah. that's insane it is yeah i love those books and i can tell you mm -hmm. it always makes me think of the chinese communist party they're what, so greedy what about the giving tree that kid just keeps taking from that tree until there's nothing of the tree left. Yeah, that tree is like China watchers, China hands everywhere. The tree loves the kid, the Chinese Communist Party in this mm -hmm. analogy. Mm -hmm. That's probably pretty mean to the kid, but loves it so much, just keeps giving and giving and giving until there's nothing left to give. And then, well, we all know what happens to the tree it's in the a end. Sad, a sad it's stump, sad stump, stump. of we its just, former self. We don't want to see that happen. Well, so we've ruined delightful children books. Are there um, delightful children's movies that you could maybe uh, make a reference to? So, you know there are. I recently wrote an op-ed in the Taipei Times and the Liberty Times in Taiwan where I pointed out that the battle of the mind comes before the battle of the fist. It's a reference that I picked up in Kung Fu Panda, which is one of my favorite movies. And it refers to what the PLA is doing against Taiwan, where they're circling this island, this island nation, with bombers and with aircraft carriers. And they're, they're doing these live fire exercises right across the Taiwan Strait to try to intimidate the Taiwanese, to try to weaken their, their resolve. And if they don't do that, they can't win. They'll never achieve their objectives, because if the Taiwanese stand united, they have very good shot at coming out of this uh, very well, actually, especially if we stand united with them, if the democratic advanced industrial countries of the world stand together. But of course, if we don't stand together, then we can be picked off one by one. Well, just going back to this psychological warfare of Chinese ships surrounding their area and China Central Television broadcasting clips of uh, PLA troops invading a replica of the Taiwan presidential palace and so on. Uh, how are the mainstream people of Taiwan reacting to this? Are they succumbing to that pressure? No, not at all. I think 
either they just grow numb to it in the way that the people of South Korea, I was in, in South Korea last summer, and I remember going into the subway system and, and looking at the gas masks that they have everywhere because this is a city of about 30 million people that faces a potential you know, nerve gas attack. And people are just used to it. Same, I was just in Tokyo last week, and over there they've been doing uh, air defense, uh, you know, civil defense drills where people come out of the offices and they go into the metro system. They go underground because the North Koreans have been firing ballistic missiles over their home islands, and they just grow used to it. They almost grow numb to it. And if anything, it makes people feel very unpleasant and very un- ang- very angry ultimately nobody likes to be coerced nobody likes to be intimidated and nobody likes to be bullied and that's that's true of people everywhere it doesn't matter if you're korean or japanese or taiwanese or american and so i think many in taiwan have grown numb to it and many more have become very angry and so the average Taiwanese uh, citizen, when when polled by pollsters, will now say that they have a very low opinion of of ever ever unifying with China, even if China becomes a democracy one day. That in any scenario they can envision, because they've been tr- mistreated uh, in such a way, where it's it's kind of hardened their resolve actually and so it's kind of backfired on the chinese but what has not backfired for them at least so far has been the intimidation of american corporations international corporations and our own government that taiwan because of that it is becoming more and more isolated internationally taiwan's international space is shrinking very very quickly and very few governments or organizations anywhere have really stepped up to try to reverse what is going on. On the topic of the U.S. government, uh, I saw that your organization just tweeted today that Dana Rohrabacher, who's a U.S. Rep- House of Representatives member, has submitted a resolution to the U.S. Committee on Foreign Affairs calling for the government to resume diplomatic relations with Taiwan instead of having the one China policy. Really quick, really important. I arm wrestled Dana Rohrabacher and I won. Just throwing that out there. Please carry on. I think all of us here think that it's a good idea to move towards a more normal relationship with Taiwan. Taiwan is a country that's not treated as a country. It's a complete aberration in our foreign policy. There's no other country anywhere in the world that we treat this way. There's no other international issue anywhere where the U.S. government allows itself to be so intimidated and we distort the truth and we deny the truth, the facts on the ground. This doesn't mean that we rush to build an embassy or to change the name of AIT to an embassy in Taipei, that as we do move towards eventual diplomatic recognition to Taiwan, that we're very thoughtful about how we do that, and that whatever moves we take are very gradual. So no sudden surprises for the for the Taipei or for Beijing or for any of our allies that we think a lot about this. And one of the proposals that uh, my executive director here, Mark Stokes, has worked on is moving towards a one China, two governments. So we could actually maintain a one China policy. And of course, we define what our policy is, we can maintain that and actually have normal diplomatic relations with both Beijing and Taipei. We've done this on the Korean Peninsula. We did this with West Germany and East Germany, uh, that there are ways to do this if we set that as a strategic objective. And if we don't, ultimately what will happen is that Taiwan will become more and more isolated and China could become more and more emboldened to actually engage in really tragic acts of aggression against Taiwan. What will also happen is, over time, 
with every passing presidential election in Taiwan, it's going to become clear to the entire world that the United States doesn't really walk the talk. We talk the talk. We talk a good game about democracy and freedom and respect for everything that's in our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. But actually, when put to the test, we fail. So we, we talk a good game, but when it comes to Taiwan, we, we've actually failed. And so we do think, we do, for, for again, for both those pragmatic, cold-hearted, geostrategic interests that we have, our national security interests, we need to close the gap that we have in our relationship with Taiwan. We need to have a closer, more normal relationship with them. But we should also do it as a matter of principle. But again, however we do it, and I think there's a good debate to be had on this, however we do it, uh, hopefully it will happen in a gradual way. And there won't be any sudden tweets uh, or any sudden changes that would potentially invite a destabilizing counter move from Beijing. Well, I wonder if the Trump administration does have this sort of in their long term goal, because it seems they've been moving to sort of isolate China from the power it's traditionally had. For example, it would have been hard in the past to make a strong move to support Taiwan when China had made itself a critical middleman in the relationships between North Korea and the rest of the world. But now the most successful thing I think about the summit that they just had is it established a U.S.-North Korea direct line of communication without China there as a middleman. So that's a huge lever uh, that's huge leverage China did have. And now with the all the tariffs happening and the threat of a potential trade war, that could cut some of China's economic leverage. And if these things are successful, it might be harder to for China to really put up a fuss if a strong stance towards Taiwan came out in the future. Absolutely. I gotta say I love one China, two governments because it sounds exactly like something that the Chinese Communist Party would come up with. Like, so how could they protest? Like, They should love it. Yeah. They should love it. Well, so as we wrap up this episode of the podcast, I wonder, is there any way we can bring it back to the uh, love triangle we had set up at the beginning? Well, I want to know, does it have a happy ending? Oh. It depends. It depends on what the United States does. Do we allow Taiwan to be enter into this forced arranged marriage? Or do we stand gunpoint? up for our love? Or do we stand up for this relationship that we've had, this very heartfelt, meaningful relationship that we've had with Taiwan? I, I see it now. Tsai Ing wen and Xi Jinping, they're they're on a grassy knoll, the wedding's about to happen, and then She's the been marched down the aisle at gunpoint. At gunpoint, but then coming up the river on a speedboat is Donald Trump, and he jumps out and interrupts the wedding and says, I object. He's probably got a machine gun. It's great. I was hoping for a white horse. A speedboat? Okay, okay. He's he's going up the river on a speedboat on top of a horse. <laughs> Specifically, if that was unclear, he's on, he's, he's on a horse on a speedboat. And then when the speed door crashes, they jump, he gallops on the horse, and then they gallop off together. I think we found the thumbnail for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to Photoshop this one, Chris? I would love to. I would love to. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Ian. This was very enlightening. Uh, I hope our audience, I think our audience is really going to like it. And more importantly, I think Tsai Ing-wen and Donald Trump will love this as well. Thank you so much for having me. And the book is The Chinese Invasion Threat. We'll put the link below. And so concludes another successful China Unscripted. Good night. Or good morning. And good luck. Good luck. Godspeed. (laughs) 